The metamorphosis of Mr. McMahon going from a regular corporate boss to the craziest person on the roster was something. Each year he was slowly losing his mind and was looking less and less sane. Stone Cold started it and the rest followed up leaving him absolutely exposed mentally. A whole video wouldn't do proper justice to what Vince McMahon was doing. You just have to watch the shows because a list of his actions would fill up an entire book. The feud with Zach Gowan, his issues with his daughter, firing JR, starting a feud with Shawn Michaels because he told him to stop living in the past, and 2007 was his absolute apex. Looking back at felt like the series finale for the McMahon show, at least as a character because he can't go any further than he did that year. On the January 29th, 2007 episode of Raw, Mr. McMahon wanted to present a magazine cover. He donned a cowboy hat mocking the Texas crowd calling them stupid and the reason why he was here was because of fan appreciation night. You suck chant intensifies McMahon thanks them for making him a billionaire and in return he wanted to give the fans a gift. Not everyone though. Just one. They brought in this woman and the gift was a framed magazine cover. All of a sudden, Donald Trump pops up on the screen and he's talking about how the fans don't appreciate McMahon being cheap. And he was so desperate to combat this belief feeling he actually did a good thing. Unlike him, he wanted to give things of value. Money. And from the heavens descended cash money. Vince tried to downplay it, calling it Monopoly money and upon realizing what's up, finally came to terms that he had been Trump. And the way he was shouting was like a cartoon character. He's like, how dare Donald Trump embarrass me? You people don't deserve it. And this upset him to the point where he said, quote, I've never been embarrassed like this in my life. And Coach was glazing hard saying he added $10 of his own money here to return it to Vince. Two weeks later, the boss finally invited Trump to Raw. This was in light of a business proposal from the Donald. He made mention of their friendship and introduced him. He felt Trump was intimidated over everything, but these assumptions were proven to be false. Even though McMahon was embarrassed, Trump didn't hesitate to tell him that it's happening again tonight. McMahon had an idea of this money drop and canceled it, but about the business proposal, Trump wanted to match at WrestleMania. No words, none of that. He's like, oh, okay. Then he straight up said that he wanted to kick Vince's ass. McMahon declined due to his last injuries but had a counter proposal. He wanted to find a representative. Trump wanted to do something bigger and the boss was worried over losing a lot of money, so Trump wanted to shave his head if he beats McMahon at WrestleMania. So it's hair versus hair. He claimed Vince's hair was fake, made mention of his own hair being fake possibly, and this idea was great. Vince loved it only to decline. This only caused Trump to insinuate he's a coward and he accepted. After making a joke out of Trump, he introduced his representative the following week, Umaga. Umaga displayed a high level of aggression and threat for anybody that came in his way. However, Trump had something up his sleeve. He praised Umaga for being an animal, but said that the only way he could tame an animal is if he finds somebody superior. Bobby Lashley. McMahon was certainly caught off guard with this selection and Lashley showed zero fear. The boss called for security knowing this thing's gonna go down in a big way and the security barely kept these men separated. It wasn't until they delivered a lot of shots to each other and after the commercial break that they were separated. Then Lashley dove through a cage the next night on ECW onto Umaga. It was one of the craziest stuff. With that said, because of the complicated nature of this match, the board wanted a special referee and McMahon was fuming. He did want this referee to be in his favor but wasn't counting on it. With the contract signing ahead, another matter had to be dealt with. The special referee. McMahon had pushed for his son Shane but was in for something totally different. First of all, Eric Bischoff came out. Vince was worried but Bischoff calmed him down saying he isn't the referee. The only reason he came out was to tell him that they're gonna enjoy seeing Donald Trump shave his head. Then Mick Foley came out and once again it was expected of him to confirm he was a referee. He tried to sweet talk him before Foley asked for his job back and his request was accepted. Then he demanded that his book get promoted and all of his requests were accepted and Foley said that it was a deal. And this is when he revealed that he wasn't the referee for Wrestlemania. But the jokes concluded because Shane McMahon finally arrived. Father was dancing but not for long because Shane revealed they lost. Shane didn't want to tell him the referee but he was quite insistent and when he did, the hope that faded and the dread on his face was something. It was Stone Cold Steve Austin, a gloomy sign of what's to come at WrestleMania. Okay, adding Austin to the equation was great. The match already had some mainstream attention because of Trump, but adding Austin as a referee made it even bigger than it already was. Will he screw over Vince? How will he officiate? A bunch of questions coming from this reveal, and the contract signing was going to be cracked up. McMahon started believing Trump left the building in fear, but that was far from the truth. Vince told him that this is the last contract he signs with hair on his head and Trump disagreed saying Lashley's gonna beat his guy's ass. The match is official, McMahon made mention of a poll saying 95% of celebrities wanted to see Trump bald, then Stone Cold interrupted. He asked the crowd about each man and let's just say that Vince had a lot of heat. He gave Trump the rules of the game when he, Austin, is around. He's like, Stone Cold, he'll never work for you and warned him. Of course, Austin didn't forget about McMahon, who was laughing about this whole thing, and he's like, you got a problem with bald-headed people? And Lashley had this look of anger on his face. Austin told him somebody's gonna get a haircut. No flat top, no whatever. They're gonna be bald. After Austin left, Trump proceeded to show a picture of McMahon bald. They teased a fight, and it was anything but that. Meanwhile, Bobby Lashley was in great form. He broke the master lock. 
first time I should note, and Umaga was selected to make an example out of Eugene and McMahon even cut his hair after he spilled some coffee on him. Vince was on such a high that he wanted a match with the ECW champion Bobby Lashley. Why? Because Stone Cold meanwhile was being bought. He was unhappy with McMahon trying to sway him in his favor and he even said that this is grounds for disqualification and was ready to go get him. It was revealed to be the coach. Vince did not have anything to do with this. Austin then started talking about what he would do to the wrestlers if they broke the rules and the coach started talking about how being bald is good. Austin laughs, laughs, dies like an NXT wrestler's push and boom, stunner. McMahon did end up confronting Austin later and after a road incident with him, proceeded to beat up his driver. Bro was losing his mind at the worst time. About Bobby Lashley, the deck was stacked against him. He had to deal with Caden Murdoch, Chris Masters, Johnny Nitro, and to top it all off, Umaga came out. All McMahon had to do was go for the pinfall, and even that was botched. Lashley was left with a huge disadvantage because after the match, Umaga continued inflicting damage, leaving the ECW champion's chances slim for WrestleMania. So this was it. A high level of media attention was on this match because regardless of the stipulation, Trump is a big name. He had a lot going on on TV at the time, and as a kid, this was the match this was the most hyped match for WWE. I remember WWE made it an effort to promote the hell out of this match, even more so than John Cena and Shawn Michaels and Batista and The Undertaker. Of course, THE match for me was seen in HBK, but WWE saw it differently and for obvious reasons. The match itself was solid, I'd say. It was hardly the main attraction, of course. Austin played the role as he said he would, and this got him a Samoan spike. So Shane McMahon ran in and became the special referee after the coast to coast. The balls in McMahon's court, the cards were perfectly laid out, and all was going well, but then Stone Cold woke up, and at this point, even the ring keeper wanted Vince Bald ringing the bell at two. It was a mistake, of course. Shane tried to save him from the inevitable, and in some ways, this looked like it worked because Vince made it to the ramp. Suddenly, Lashley turned into Prime Devin Hester or something and sprinted down the ramp, catching him, and he's like, get your ass over here, you got a haircut. Stunner, and there it is, the million dollar picture, the image that would be on newspapers on April 2nd, 2007. When watching this, it really feels like the end of the villainous Mr. McMahon, the super tyrant who did as he pleased. And he was still in some ways, but after this, he lost some of that supreme power he used to throw around. He's the only owner that embarrasses himself for the sake of it. Then Stone Cold almost stunned Trump. It was an attempt, but man, was it so bad. I mean, he did stun him, but the selling was horrible. This match had been done under odd circumstances as well. That's one thing I should mention. Trump had Vince sign a contract where the agreement was his hair couldn't be touched regardless of what happened in the match another was for vince to donate four million dollars to a charity those were the terms this was actually revealed a couple of months ago okay so from here on it was only gonna get wilder the next night on raw mr mcmahon was eager to go out to the ring and talk the coach was worried over what everyone would think of him and the wrestlers were on the verge of exploding the king said that he looked like an old comedian the boss refused to be humbled saying he's a bald billionaire and even went as far as to say that he's changing the record books he's the winner and to prove his point that bobby lashley can't beat umaga he's gonna face him for the ecw championship mcmahon said that the fans aren't gonna see his head and claimed that the hat was surgically cemented on his head he even said that the doctor told him that he has more raw testosterone than an all-male prison. Oh, man. Seeing him bald is the equivalent of no chance in hell. That's what he said. Bobby Lashley, though, wanted to test that claim. He tried to strike, but Lashley grabbed his hat, and he started putting things on his head before going into hiding under skirts. It's crazy. So Lashley stripped. This is the most 2000 segment. Minus the end of this segment, it felt like some cartoon. McMahon's humiliation was a problem for everybody in sight as well. Armando Estrada was made Umaga's partner despite the looming threat above Estrada, he came up short. Shane McMahon, meanwhile, felt that this was a stain against the McMahon name and confronted Bobby Lashley about this. He told Lashley that he took his family's dignity at WrestleMania, so now he's taking the ECW championship away from him. Umaga came up, but Shane wanted to do things his way and was very hostile and aggressive about it. Lashley wanted this match but wanted to shave his head just like he did to father. Shane almost seemed worried over the situation, but ended up accepting. This match was revealed to be a setup, though, and Don McMahon finally had a smile on his face. He started shouting at Lashley that he did this to him and his punishment is at Backlash. Tonight may have never been for the title, but at Backlash it will be. He said that it's going to be Umaga, Shane, and himself. Handicap match. McMahon's humiliation at his own creation brought out the fury of hell upon Bobby Lashley. The ECW champion though wasn't interested in paying for his sins as he cost Umaga the Intercontinental Championship in Milan. Shane McMahon and Vince meanwhile had felt motivated to prepare for this match. Shane even challenged the fans and even asked of Jose Mourinho if he wanted to come to the ring. The special one wasn't interested though. Shane McMahon said that he scoured all over for somebody to fight him and he chose a guy who some of you are familiar with Robbie Brookside this turned out to be a one-sided beating but the McMahons are prepared for this match and they're ready to go all out to take away the title and clean up their image after what had occurred at Wrestlemania as for the match at Backlash I believe this was the first time McMahon wore the do-rag 
I don't think Hotlanta was ready for such a fashion statement. Durag Vince had some hidden powers behind him because he managed to become champion against Super Bobby Lashley. Lashley of course had to endure Umaga and Shane, but he was very resilient throughout the match. The numbers though overwhelmed him and the boss was the new champion. This was bizarre. ECW had been back for a year and the champions were RVD, Big Show, and now Vince McMahon. And not only that, but a Durag wearing boss. What? The reception this title victory received was mostly negative at the time. Some fans felt that ECW was reduced to a joke by having McMahon as champion. Or, if he was already considered a joke, the final nail in the coffin for the rebrand. When you look at others talking about it now, it's a different story, but then it was seen as disgraceful. The thing is, ECW already died. It died in early 2001, and the rebrand itself died in December of 2006, so it's like beating a dead horse. Let's at least be entertained by it, right? The next night on Raw, he confronted John Cena and started talking like he's on crack. He's shouting, what up, homes? The champ is here. Cena said that he ain't ECW unless it stands for extremely crazy white guy. He even said that if HBK wins the WWE title, he could come after the big one. <laughs> With Bobby Lashley on the side, Mr. McMahon had to address the complaints of the ECW originals. Rob Van Dam here expressed dissatisfaction and disappointment over McMahon killing ECW. Once he heard about this, he thought, whatever. Let's have Umaga beat the hell out of RVD. He even shared a moment with his son over here. Also, what is this image? But anyways, the ECW originals confronted him and RVD shouted that he made a mockery out of the name. Sandman told him to read between the lines. Tommy Dreamer was told his boots were fly and said that ECW wasn't brought back because of Vince. It was because of the fans. For the champion, talk was cheap and asked if they wanted a fight. Turns out he wanted to face the winner of the Fatal 4-Way Extreme Rules match. RVD ended up winning the match and Bobby Lashley meanwhile was looking for his title shot but Vince threatened. Since he couldn't touch him, Vince opted to show a clip of backlash. The provoking level here was out of this world. Do you want to call me champ? Do you want to beat me up? But a title shot was in the way of all this. He's like, oh, you're not going to get the title shot if you do that. This picture was of course out of date and McMahon said that this is the way it should be. Lashley, he was eager to have the rematch at Judgment Day and the way he promoted it made it seem like it was a one-on-one, -on -one, but then he added Umaga and Shane. It was very simple for Lashley, but tempting to keep his composure. Instead, he attacked the coach. As for RVD, he had to fight like hell and even that wasn't enough to steer clear and recapture the title. Compared to the previous month, Bobby Lashley looked more determined than ever to win back his title and this clearly irritated irritated prison Vince. Damn what a tackle. Shane stopped Lashley in his tracks before an attempted attack on his father and Lashley's pace was on par with Shane's and just as he's about to get him he hops in the limo and Lashley turns around and boom he gets blasted with the title. I'm telling you guys that do-rag gives him powers he would have never thought of something like this beforehand. But for all these deceitful tactics Lashley easily overcame the trio at Judgment Day and left Vince absolutely dejected and disappointed with these turn of events. It didn't even take him five minutes. Umaga suddenly attacked and McMahon revealed that Lashley didn't become champion. Why? Because he didn't beat him. Ah this is a disgrace. I don't know why they dragged out this feud maybe they loved the do-rag character. It was an average story with do-rag Vince carrying like 2007 LeBron on the Cavaliers or something. But that was coming to an end. He stopped wearing the do-rack. It was regular Vince from here on. The next night on Raw, Bobby Lashley said that to become champion, he has to beat Vince. So he challenged him to a match. It wasn't like the boss was afraid, but he declined. Instead, he was focused on one nice stand. He was interested in defending his title in a street fight. His opponent? The Blue Bean. As for Lashley, he has no chance in hell. Shane went on to add a couple of words before Father finally accepted the challenge. However, Bobby Lashley has to beat every one of his opponents in a gauntlet match to receive the title shot at one nice stand. He went through everyone including Umaga, but there was only one man left. Shane McMahon. All it took was one clutch moment and he had Father believing his title reign was over. The build for the match was incredibly limited and it meant that they had to rush it. Shane scored a victory over Lashley and Cena in a handicap match and the other two had one final confrontation on ECW. Vince wanted to know why Lashley comes back time and time again and he said that he wants to come back for the championship. And this is where the champion corrected him saying it's him. He claimed that he won't enter Lashley's world. Why? Because he's from the streets. Lashley said Vince doesn't know anything about the streets and that he's born with a silver spoon. The champ said that that this is Lashley's last stand. Losing means he's done. Things got more intense as Bobby said that he's stripping him of the title and was told to respect his elders. Vince was like, I'm old enough to be your uncle to which Lashley responded, my dad's uncle. This Sunday, I'll become ECW champion again. That's what he said. Okay, this match wasn't that important in the long run on paper. However, the effect it had on Mr. McMahon and his storylines was huge. The trio had multiple opportunities to take out the challenger, but despite the odds in their favor, they were overwhelmed. Lashley had endured a mauling for the most part, but moments of brilliance opened up the McMahon family lock and steered Lashley to victory, and he was once again the ECW champion. 
Unknowingly, he sent McMahon's life into one of the most bizarre eight months I've ever seen in wrestling. To say this loss was demoralizing would be a huge understatement. Lost his title, lost his mind. He just randomly popped up the next night talking crazy to John Cena. You trying to embarrass me or trying to humiliate me for not being world champion? He repeated his name twice over two minutes and John Cena told him the only thing keeping Vince alive is his patience. He randomly shouted Cena was a liar for claiming he lost his mind and since he lost his title, Cena's gonna lose his when he defends the goal tonight. He then followed up with Santino, the Hardy Boys, and to top it all off, it got to the point where Vince started believing a black cloud is on the horizon, and he couldn't get rid of it. Hell, he even said that next week, he's gonna feel better. Why? Because it's the draft and Mr. McMahon appreciation night. The next night on ECW, he sat on a rocking chair during Lashley's match. It was flat out odd, and the commentary made mention this. Later that week on SmackDown, Edge invited him as a guest on the Cutting Edge, and when he brought him out, he quoted a Psalms verse saying, Ye, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art evil, and his body language is all over the place, and Edge told him that the future is bright. The way he was sitting, it was like he had a stick in his ass or something. Edge tried to draw inspiration in him and motivate him to look past one night stand, but it wasn't working. Hell, Edge even called him a world champion. He handed it to him like it's a retirement ceremony or something, and this is when he told Edge that he's a sycophant. Bro was cracked up beyond belief saying, Vengeance is mine and booked him in a title match against Batista. Edge is like, it's not fair, and Vince responded saying, life is not fair, life sucks, and then you die. But then he added, do or die. So basically what he's trying to say is that if Edge wins, he wins, Batista's done, he can't challenge for the title. This was the most strange segment in a minute. He was out of his mind, he was lost, nobody knew what was up. Later that night, he looked all good, but then Ashley bumped into him and the coffee spilled. No problem for all of two minutes because he suspended her claiming she meant to do it. But this was only the beginning. On Raw Appreciation Night, he gave a bunch of wrestlers the chance to talk about what they truly think of Vince McMahon. They did not seem fond of him, and when it came down to it at the end of the night, he just said thank you and walked out. He goes to the back. The lower and the mid carters are lined up. Paul London is smiling because Vince goes the wrong way, and when he exits to his limo, breathes a sigh of relief. He hesitates to enter his limo, but when he does, it explodes. <laughs> This was crazy. WWE wanted to do a big storyline. This storyline easily stands out as a big one. It was crazy. I used to watch Raw every week and this this was wild. Easily stands out. If you have any semblance of memory from this time period, then for sure you remember this. It's too memorable to forget. Mr. McMahon, the owner of WWE, the man that casted terror on half of the roster, ceased to exist. This was in modern times almost unprecedented, at least in WWE because Lucha Underground and Impact enjoy killing characters. The story had an eerie presence about it because McMahon seemed peaceful in his future and it also meant that WWE was going to have a big summer storyline. And this formula carried on over the next couple of years. Mr. McMahon's death shook the core of WWE and while it was a time of mourning in light of tragedy, it was also a time for investigation. What I liked about this storyline is how fresh it was. It could have sucked or whatever but no doubt was it entertaining. He had a 10 bell salute in honor of McMahon, held some tribute matches and even had a bunch of wrestlers discuss their experience with their former boss. Ironically, the Vengeance Night of Champions theme song was gone by Fuel. This would become weirder a week later as well. Stephanie McMahon addressed her father's death on Raw and announced a tribute show for Raw the following week. She was emotional as expected, but also mentioned that her family was seeking vengeance for the perpetrator of the limousine explosion. Edge was looking for suspects and accused Tori Wilson of this heinous act. Why? Because she's so far out of the left field that it's the ones you least expect. The lead investigator was making progress and revealed that a well-known personality was at the crime scene. This confused the commentary and at the time it was hyped. Up. WWE ran a commercial for the show and everything looked set. Memorial service. Every wrestler from all three brands was to attend. John Cena, Edge, CM Punk, Elijah Burke, all of them. And that day was set to be historic. But the memory we all have of that day was a tribute show to somebody else. Chris Benoit. The actions of Chris Benoit and the tragedy of Daniel and Nancy put a huge black mark, and rightfully so, on the storyline. You can't really swerve from a storyline like this for two minutes and then be like, yeah, about Vince, he's dead, yada yada. And it's not because of the act of wrestling being exposed. Because if you were a kid like me, you saw some WWE's fake video with fake it by C they're playing in the background or something. If you were over the age of 10, 99% of you knew what wrestling was all about. But it was about the respect to Daniel and Nancy. They couldn't really go back to the storyline. Vince McMahon came out on the June 25th, 2007 episode of Raw and publicly spoke about Chris Benoit's death. He's standing in the ring, out of character, not talking nonsense, and not to mention the story already had some controversy behind it due to the multiple deaths of wrestlers over the past few months. In addition, some people actually believe he died. Even Trump. It was for a single moment, of course, and searches of Vince McMahon skyrocketed in the weeks of the limo explosion. 
Another thing to mention is that Sensational Sherry passed away on June 15th, and the storyline had just begun. Since there was so much media attention over the Benoit tragedy and simply being downright wrong at the time, the storyline was dropped. The circumstances that the storyline was brought under were odd as well. According to the report here, the idea was first presented in February of 2005. It called for Carlito who was using his underworld connections to make Theodore Long's life miserable to have a bomb planted in Long's car. Similar to Monday's raw angle with McMahon, Long was to walk to the car, open the door, and presumably die in the explosion. WWE writer Tom Sheehock supported the Dave Lagana penned idea, but Brian Gewartz dismissed the idea as being too far-fetched. Stephanie McMahon agreed with Gewartz that the proposal never even reached Vince McMahon's desk. Interestingly, under pressure from Bonnie Hammer to increase WWE Raw ratings, a version of the angle took place in 2007 on the show for which Gewartz serves as lead writer. <laughs> Carlito's gonna do all this? Damn! The reported plan for the storyline is all over the place. It's because the reporters don't have a clear idea because Vince changes plans all the time and around here. The dirt sheets were correct a little too often. But the famous story goes, the original idea was to be along the lines of the famous Dallas soap opera storyline of Who Shot JR. Vince's entire family was going to return to TV in full force, including his real-life brother Rod McMahon and his family. Rod lives, or at least did at the time, in North Carolina and has pretty much zero contact with Vince. The company had actually contacted him and he agreed to go show up for Vince's funeral, but of course that never took place. No contact was ever made with Rod again. I can't remember who it was, but at one point someone on one of our radio shows years back, when we used to have the former WWE writers on during WrestleMania weekend, mentioned that Vince, while gone in storyline, would be amassing a hobo army to try to reclaim his throne upon returning. That was never the case, although there were preliminary discussions about how when Vince was gone, he'd grow out his hair and beard and fingernails and basically play a Howard Hughes-style recluse character. Those ideas never got very far, and in the end, there was going to be a full investigation into who killed Vince, and it would be revealed that Mr. Kennedy, the now Mr. Anderson in Aces and Eight and TNA, would reveal himself to be the illegitimate son of Vince. Long-term idea, and keep in mind at this point, there was really no such thing as long-term ideas because Vince still changed his mind on a dime, was that there would be a number of swerves leading to a will being discovered. It would lead to a big reveal on Raw that Vince left the company to Kennedy and the storyline would either be that Kennedy got the company or there would be a battle between Kennedy and Stephanie or Shane where whoever was the most ruthless would end up with it. This is going to play out all the way to WrestleMania 24 where Vince would make his triumphant return, side with Kennedy and presumably it would go on from there. Damn. It was long term so the plans might have changed but they were aiming high. WWE had to had a big storyline like this in years and with the TV drama aspect to it, I'm sure it would have been a rating success but since they had to pivot to a different storyline, it meant a lot would be different. Figure 4 Wrestling in August of 2007 revealed the McMahon paternity angle will lead to a WrestleMania 24 match between Mr. Kennedy and Triple H. The plan is to slowly drop hints towards who the illegitimate son is and reveal on a 3 hour Raw special in October that is Mr. Kennedy. Triple H will announce that he's Vince's son-in-law, which is how the match between him and Kennedy will develop. Stephanie McMahon will make her return this fall to get involved in the angle. Shane McMahon is going to get involved around the Royal Rumble. And USA Network executive Bonnie Hammer is the one behind the three-hour Raw special and is very satisfied with the angle. WWE has a backup plan in case the storyline is not successful with the fans. Mr. Kennedy would reveal that he faked the lab results in order to inherit McMahon's money. Whoa, 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 whoa. Again, I have to mention this. This stuff is mostly true because there was this former WWE writer that used to leak information and he was fired in May of 2008. But as I said, this was a big story. It would have done wonders for Mr. Kennedy's career because they couldn't really back off after this point, right? On the August 6, 2007 episode of Raw, Mr. McMahon finally made his return and immediately called for the wrestlers to be in attendance for his return promo. He casually came out like he was expected to be around and McMahon addressed the last time he appeared on Raw in the limo explosion incident. He said that that's the way he wanted to go out. Why? Because he wanted to know if people really cared. It was simply that. Staging his demise was all about seeing others as true character. He then booked a battle royal with the winner becoming the new general manager of Raw. But that wasn't the big story of the day. Later that night, the boss received a phone call from his accountant. It was clear that something big was looming ahead for him. The IRS were investigating him and he started going off on the news being just for entertainment and held a strong disdain towards the IRS. Not him. It was looking like some sort of corrupt dealing storyline or something like that and then Coach received a summons on behalf of McMahon and when inspecting the documents, it was big. Meanwhile, McMahon was having deja vu and it turns out he had another kid and a paternity suit was filed against him. The name of the child was withheld from him and this left him 
incensed. His belief was that this was extortion. Why would he be intimidated if he's not scared of the government and the media? Who's your daddy? Chance intensifies. He shouted, nothing bothers him, and even went as far as to say that he didn't care what the fans think. All of a sudden, Stephanie McMahon came out. He accused her of having something to do with this information for money, and she revealed that her half-brother or sister was standing around this rink. I'm probably delusional, but I'm pretty sure I heard a Kennedy chant, just a little. They all started pointing at each other. I mean, it's obviously Chuck Palumbo. And the teases... The teases, they, they were something. The search for the kid was a tough task. Vince listed a million stories, and at one point, he overspoke next to his wife. But with the search on, it brought some odd faces. McMahon held resentment over his daughter revealing such information, and the coach believed he was going to accurately predict the correct wrestler. He mentioned a black woman in the 70s, Kansas City, to top it all off, the coach was adopted. And upon hearing this, McMahon was ready to jump out of a window. The coach was so desperate to reveal this wrestler so soon despite the obstacles ahead. Initially, it was Eugene, but then Vince debunked the Kentucky story saying he didn't do it with his cousin. In Eugene Clement, this story is the reason why Eric Bischoff became a big figure at WCW and wanted to take him out of business. Who's next? Long lost daughter, Melina. He aggressively denied it because he already did some business with her. And Molina was like, better hope I'm not your daughter because I'm going to sue you for every cent. He called her a bitch. And the last one, he was eager to get it over with. It was Stone Cold Steve Austin. His reaction says it all. McMahon said that there's no chance in hell. Austin talked about how Vince always has his grapefruits busy and kicked them before continuing with the low blow. Austin hits the stunner on the coach and the search continues. Things were looking up though. Mr. Kennedy was looking more and more likely. For one, he had Vince's middle name and in addition, in his eyes, Kennedy walked funny. I mean, doesn't he walk funny as well? At the same time, Triple H was back and casting a terror on the boss. He claimed he found a bunch of ladies that may have had some relations with McMahon, and even Carlito's sister was brought, and he was dejected. He tricked them into saying he likes chicken cocks. He's like, you hate animals. No, I love animals. I love cats. You hate roosters. Oh, I love roosters. You hate cocks. Oh, I love cocks. And this was the start of the feud. McMahon was very confident about his kid being revealed meanwhile because the woman doesn't have any patience in his eyes. He believed that this was going to end real soon. But in front of this big reveal was the family. They brought their attorneys and were ready to go to war. Linda told him that she doesn't want his money and he began shouting about how he was lonely on the road and that he worked his hands to the bone to build this empire. Stephanie came out and he called her a hellcat and added that she's the volatile one. He wanted to show a clip of the good times with his daughter but then Triple H showed a totally different one. She said that if Vince is unfit then he should step down as chairman and to top it all off Shane McMahon was here. He wasn't as aggressive as the other two in his approach but held a lot of resentment over father's recent actions. The death faking incident, walking around all proud, Shane told him that if he wants to change it's up to him because it's all about the family legacy and messing around with it is not the best scenario they all believed he could change shane even said that he always wanted a brother vince vowed to be a better human and promised everything but then mr kennedy interrupted the coach was caught off guard with his presence and this is when kennedy spoke about how these similarities with vince were a coincidence the biggest was that the reveal was happening in green bay wisconsin for context Kennedy's from there. He straight up called him dad and said that he's his son. He basically tried to undo all this progress Vince made in the last two minutes, saying he accepts all of them. He's like, oh, you don't have to change for anybody. I like you the way you are. The best part was when he shouted his name and added McMahon. But then Barack Obama from Ohio came out and he revealed that the DNA test is indeed a WWE wrestler. However, the son wasn't Mr. Kennedy. So who was? Well, the client wanted to drag this until Raw. In the meantime, they were throwing out riddles. Things were looking up was one of them. Great Khali came to mind, but it clearly wasn't him. When it came down to it, things were interesting. Mr. Kennedy wasn't on display for this one. And what's funny is that nothing was in the way, except for his own mistake with the whole wellness policy thing. It is what it is, you know, it's, it's a shame for him because, as I said, this was going to be a big story. And he was doing very well at the time. He's going to have a big match at WrestleMania. It is what it is. Obama once again dragged it out. He's like, the sun is not extreme. The Sandman missed the memo. He's like, oh, the sun has a fondness for gold. The sun's skin is fair. Shelton and Henry were so damn disappointed over this one. He's like, the sun's hair is fair as well. I love how they lose the smiles on their faces. They think they're about to become rich or something. They're about to inherit a lot of money from father. But then he's like, you are not the sun. Kennedy chant intensifies and McMahon says that he's suspended for impersonating a McMahon. What's next? Individual. So that means Kane and Murdoch are out. And the best of all, the sun loves to play the game. So him and Stephanie, was that? It's a storyline Vince wanted. The look of anger and disappointment on Triple H's face was out of this world. None of them believed this. Obama said that the Sun plays a bunch of games and these games clearly didn't relate to Triple H. It was Hornswoggle and Vince ceased to exist. 
one of the most bizarre reveals of this era of WWE. Hornswoggle, aka little bastard. At this point, what, what do you do with a storyline that was starting series? You know, this had a series at the beginning. It was very big. What are you going to do with it? The plans WWE had for Mr. Kennedy were ridiculous. To be the son of Vince McMahon, it couldn't have been underwhelming for him, even if he wanted it to be. Because a storyline like this will bring all the attention on you, and in turn will have most of the screen time. So by changing it to a comedy story, it avoids the commitment to a certain wrestler, because there isn't many on the roster that could be Vince McMahon's son. The only one I could see is JBL, and even then, I don't think it would have been as good as Mr. Kennedy. He was the perfect choice at the time. Imagine someone like Edge or MVP. Obviously, MVP is a much better choice than Edge, and for a comedy storyline, Horace Wagle was right. Maybe Sandman would have been funny, trying to wear a tailored suit worth a couple of thousand, decides to drink beer and disgrace it. Mr. Kennedy, though, finally explained the process of the original reveal in an interview with the 10 Count Podcast. And I quote, I was told that it was going to be me, and we built TV that way for several weeks, and then I got in trouble. So I messed up and then I got suspended for a month, I think. Yeah, I was suspended for 30 days, I wanna say. $10,000 fine and that kinda threw everything off because like literally the week that they were supposed to reveal that it was me in Green Bay, Wisconsin of all places, and then that happened. So then that really threw a wrench into everything and they said, alright, we're going this way. But yeah, Hornswoggle was a son. Being a compassionate father, Vince wanted to put his son Hornswoggle up for adoption. Before this, he told Hornswoggle that he's eventually gonna come across a bunch of money. But he wanted Hornswoggle to know that life isn't just about money. Then he said adoption and <laughs> Hornswoggle's smile faded. And there were his new parents. Hornswoggle refused to accept this, and McMahon was forcing this to be a thing. Unfortunately for him, they didn't want anything to do with Hornswoggle after he misbehaved, and they ran away like they were dealing with Bobby Lashley or something. It dawned upon McMahon that pushing Hornswoggle away was going to be tough. He told him that he should stay away and that he's not in the family. He even called him a disgrace and expressed regret over having him as a son. Then Triple H came out. He made a joke out of his father-in-law and said that he has a small penis. So Vince booked him in a handicap match against Cade and Murdoch. This wasn't a problem for Triple H, and despite the shortcomings, it was a nice night for McMahon. He got rid of Hornswoggle. Little did he know, though, this chaos would make its way to Teddy Long and Crystal's wedding, and this thing was funny. They are hopping around the place, the Godfather and the host took everyone to the back with them, it was crazy. It was a stressful time for Vince, he hated Hornswoggle, didn't want to take care of him, and on the other side he had to deal with Triple H. Dealing with Triple H was much easier though, he booked him in a handicapped steel cage match against Carlito and himself, and he called out Hornswoggle and said that he didn't mean all those things. It was just a test to see if he wanted money. All is well now. Then he asked if he'd like to meet a woman, Melina. Why? Because in his eyes, Hornswoggle being a McMahon means great power and great money. She said that he's cute, she, she even called him horny. I mean at this point horny was interested. She clearly showed her true colors here, she was talking bad about him. As for Vince, he managed to escape the cage leaving the game fuming. Hornswoggle meanwhile was down horrendous, he was down 6 feet under and he's having fun while Vince was preparing to make a run for it after the cage match. Just as he's opening the door, there's the game. He challenges him to a match and questions his manhood to get him to accept. As expected, the match is full of drama. Carlito was the referee, Umaga interfered, and every man, despite what happened, lived to fight another day. Triple H was still in tough situations for McMahon, but the main story was Hornswoggle. WWE was, I guess, testing out PG stuff at this point. Vince was expecting Hornswoggle to be taken care of, completely unaware of the terror he was causing Regal and the coach, some Tom and Jerry-esque stuff, and it got to the point where the coach wanted to match with Hornswoggle. He knew Vince was out of the country, and capitalizing on this moment was essential. He told Regal that Hornswoggle wanted to inherit money, so Coach made a match between Umaga and Hornswoggle. Not much came out of it because Triple H made the safe. Coach's suspicions about McMahon disliking Hornswoggle were proven true. He was teaching him to have a strong mentality and to hate, so he was going to have him wrestle the coach. Mick Foley was revealed to be the special referee, and the coach did the most only to come up short. Vince was checking up on Hornswoggle's form often to test him, and his next test was the Great Kali. Regal and Coach trained him in front of the NWA fans, and the coach refused to go through. But after Regal verbally eviscerated him, he followed up. And the coach was forced to be a dummy, and Hornswoggle won with ease. McMahon was using this Kali match as a way to see his own son get destroyed, but it was hidden deep within the message of showing strength. The McMahons motivated him enough, but when the bell rang, that was a different story. The fans didn't really care, they wanted to heat Shaq, Shaquille O'Neal. They teased it, but it didn't happen. Honestly, if they could've, it, it would've been better than what happened, but it is what it is. McMahon shot it, he didn't give a damn what they want, and the match was extremely one-sided, and the only time Hornswoggle was on offense was winning win after Ranjin Singh. Hornswoggle had to be saved by Finley, and the effects of Finley's actions were long-term damaging. The next night, same thing. He saved Hornswoggle and helped him beat Carlito, so Vince wanted to put his luck of the Irish to the test and made a match between Finley and the Great Kali. He lured Hornswoggle elsewhere, and it turned into the goofiest segment in years. About Finley, he came out of that match with Armageddon scathed, but managed to score the win. Hornswoggle was developing a winning streak as well, and whenever Vince threw at him, he overcomes it. So this time, he brought in William Regal. 
The boss was front and center and even told Regal to use the brass knucks, but Regal didn't have that hate in his heart. He revealed that it was a test and he failed. It was about testing if Regal was still the same cold, heartless man he was. Hornswoggle, meanwhile, had to qualify for the Royal Rumble. He had to find a tag team partner, though. Finley wasn't available, so he chose Mick Foley. They won it and were officially in the match. McMahon was constantly throwing something in Hornswoggle's way and Finley had enough. McMahon denied responsibility about bringing Kali out there and Finley trying to talk about some deal between them. They did not elaborate further on this deal afterwards. It was just a small thing. After Hornswoggle's Royal Rumble performance where he relied on Finley to save him, he made his father disappointed. Vince claimed it was to set an example for his son. It was all about discipline and he shouted that the parents should make their kids kiss their ass. So he called out Hornswoggle and pulled his pants down. Finley finally interrupted and again, he's shouting about discipline. Hornswoggle bit his ass instead. <laughs> As a result of this, he had to go one on one with his father. This was not one of the most emotional matches of 2008. Vince warned Finley not to come out, yet he disobeyed his orders, and just as he's about to fire him, he backs off. Vince used this as a way to tell Hornswoggle that Finley's a coward and took a shillelagh shot. The match was still on though, and Hornswoggle hit the tadpole splash to win the match. Vince refused to let this slide and was preparing some dismissal papers, but he ended up changing his mind and said that he's getting his son in the ring inside a steel cage. This match had a surprise to JBL. He attacked Finley and handcuffed him, allowing Vince to whoop his son, and even JBL got some shots in. Finley was going crazy and Vince felt that he had done enough. He expressed regret over the situation and said that Hornswoggle didn't deserve the beating from JBL, so he called for him to come out and apologize. He threatened to beat him up and said that JBL was simply there to watch Finley, not beat up his son. JBL almost refused to apologize, but he went through with this saying he's sorry he didn't do it sooner. He claimed to find information that Hornswoggle isn't the son. He's Finley's son. This conspiracy comes from Vince's family, and Finley knew about this. JBL promised to show proof and promised to make Finley admit it. They were set for a confrontation the following week, and Vince asked Finley if he conspired with his family. He admitted it was true and also said that Vince wasn't good enough to be Hornswoggle's father. Finley admitted that he was Hornswoggle's father and JBL was via satellite. He said that he was with Finley's son, and Finley wanted to fight with Bradshaw, but JBL wanted the match until WrestleMania. He then gave Hornswoggle a beating in the dark. The hell? So that concludes the illegitimate son storyline. The thing is, it was a drag. There was too many goofy moments, TVG stuff. One minute Triple H is bleeding and the next Hornswoggle is going through walls. It was unnecessary. Hornswoggle though, it was the biggest thing in his career and he looks back on it finally. And while most of us don't look at it that way, it's understandable why. So where did Vince go from here? He wanted to retire Ric Flair. The same man that started the rule was going to have the chance to end it. The street fight rules greatly benefited McMahon, but even then, Shawn Michaels refused to let it end here. He cost Vince the match, and Flair took advantage. Vince stopped appearing in storylines from here on, and he was always around, but he wasn't doing much. On the May 26, 2008 episode of Raw, Mr. McMahon promised to show the fans appreciation. He said that this idea had never been done on TV before, and he wanted to return the favor to the fans and said that it was all about the money. He wanted to give away money and said that he should give away a million dollars. And this is where the idea of the million dollar mania came from. This thing was for ratings, of course. I remember you couldn't go 10 minutes without thinking about this contest. You had to watch Raw and find the code if I remember correctly. It was a million dollars per episode too. At one point, he gave a fan $2. A guy chose to Rick roll him twice over 200k. I mean, he has his priorities straight, right? McMahon was struggling to get the phone working. The next thing you know, you're here. Never gonna give you up. Never gonna let you down. Then came draft night. Vince gave away a lot of money. He was set to give away 500k at the end of the night, and he follows up when half of the set starts collapsing. It was one of the most bizarre things to happen in WWE. The set falls and traps him, the wrestlers try to save him, and he has to be stretchered out of there, leading to the McMahons taking over, and Mike Adamly becoming the GM. Damn. So that's the McMahon storyline. Upon his return, he got punted by Randy Orton, he feuds with Orton and Legacy, and then has the Bret Hart thing. And that's the end. The Bret Hart thing's a story for another day, but... Man, this was a crazy one. McMahon was all over the place here. He was feuding with Trump. He was wearing a do-rag. He had an illegitimate son. He faked his death. He whooped his son's ass. He had a lot going on. It was crazy. The best part of this run was probably do-rag McMahon. Other than that, it was just regular McMahon. He, he's always a great character, you know. Like, at the end of the day, outside the ring, it's a different story. But inside, McMahon is literally one of the best characters of the 2000s. One of the best wrestling characters of all time. And here, he was always entertaining, you know. Like, I'm not going to be like... Oh, the storyline sucks. It's boring. It, it probably does suck, but it's not boring. That's one thing for sure. He was always doing something. It was crazy. So, yeah. All right, what do you guys think of Mr. McMahon's storylines? Please comment down below. And that's it for this video. Make sure you hit the stun on the like button and perhaps the close on the subscribe button. Peace. I'm out.